My name is Rich Clifford and I'm one of the benefit administrators at the Division of Retirement in the Bureau of Retirement Calculations. And in the Bureau of Retirement Calculations, that's the section of the division that is going to uh, provide you with benefit estimates when you request. Um, we also, um, you know, will process uh, your service retirement paperwork and do uh, on retired payroll, and also if you're retiring through the DROP program, we're going to process your DROP retirement paperwork and get you into the DROP. So um, we've got a pretty jam-packed uh, presentation today. Um, we have several different presenters. Um, myself, I will be presenting understanding your benefits under the FRS pension plan. Uh, to you, and then we'll go to uh, estate planning where we'll have uh, Dan Grable from the FRS uh, guidance line uh, present to you on that. And then after lunch, uh, we'll have the presentation on continuing your state group insurances, uh, insurance uh, after you retire. And then we'll have a presentation uh, by the Deferred Comp uh, compensation program uh, of the Department of Financial Services and then our last presenter of the day will be Social Security and after that um, there will be staff available to answer any questions about the estimates that we provided you in the uh, envelopes when you walked in the door okay so with that we're gonna go ahead and get started okay so again, my name is Rich Clifford, and um, I'm, I, as I told you, I'm a benefits administrator uh, in the Bureau of Retirement uh, Calculations at the Division of Retirement. My presentation to you today is based upon three different publications, and each of you should be reading these publications to fully understand your retirement benefits. The first one is the FRS Member Handbook. If you read this handbook, this is going to explain everything that you need to know about uh, your retirement benefits under the FRS Pension Plan. The second booklet that you should be reading is the Ready, Set, Retire Guide. This guide is going to tell you everything that you need to know uh, in preparation for retirement, what happens when you retire, and what happens after you retire. And the uh, third publication, if you're contemplating retiring through the DROP program, is uh, to read the Deferred Retirement Option Program Guide, okay? And that's what the acronym DROP stands for. Uh, this guide is going to uh, tell you everything about DROP, uh, explain, uh, it has a Q&A session at the back of it that will answer any of your questions um, that you may have. Now, obviously, um, there's a lot of information that needs to be presented uh, in my presentation to you today, but I only have an hour and a half um, approximately to present to you. And uh, you're not going to remember everything that I've told you, but this is going to give you a good overview. So this presentation should not be in lieu of reading these three publications that I referenced. You should be uh, re uh, making sure that these are put on your mandatory reading list. These publications can be found on the Division of Retirement's website, which is frs.myflorida.com. And if you go down the navigation bar on the left-hand side of the page, you can go down to where it says Publications, and then click on Retirement Guides. These guides are updated every two years, okay? So if you want to obtain the most recent publication, you should be going to the Division of Retirement's website to obtain the most recent publication. All right, so in my attempt to explain retirement benefits to you uh, during this workshop, or if you read these guides and you have any questions about uh, uh, the explanations given in those guides, uh, ultimately we follow chapter 121 of the Florida statutes in administering the Florida retirement system, and uh, chapter, rule chapter 60S are the rules for the FRS pension plan, and we follow those, and because retirement benefits are taxable, the Internal Revenue Code remains the final authority as far as taxation of benefits. Because it's pertinent to future slides in my presentation, I need to give you a little historical background on the FRS. When the FRS was first created in 1970, it took two uh, plans, the old teacher's retirement system and the old state and county and officer's employee's retirement system, which were both underfunded plans, and merged them into the Florida retirement system. And when the Florida retirement system was created, there was only one plan under the FRS, and that was the FRS pension plan. 
And uh, when it was initially created, it was an employee contributory plan. And then the legislature passed a bill that went into effect in January of 1975, which said employees don't have to make any employee contributions, that the employers themselves would be making the employee contributions or making those contributions on behalf of the employee. And of course, we all know that changed because the legislature passed another bill that went into effect July 1st, 2011, that said once again, we had to start making employee contributions. So we see those 3% employee contributions come out of our account. Now what happened was in about the 2000 legislative session, the legislature said there should be a second plan under the FRS as an alternative plan. And uh, they passed that bill and uh, basically the FRS investment plan uh, came about as a result of that bill and that be was, uh, uh, began to be offered uh, beginning July 1st of 2002. Okay, and when that happened, if you were actively employed on that date, you had to make your initial plan choice, whether you wanted to stay in the FRS pension plan or whether you wanted to go over to the FRS investment plan. And uh, if you were employed subsequent to the creation of that plan, you have that initial plan choice period in which to make your election. If you did not make an election, then by default, you had an election to the FRS pension plan. Now you do have a one-time second election that you can make to switch plans prior to retiring and while you're actively employed with an FRS participating employer. However, um, uh, you should know the differences between the two plans. There are big differences. The FRS pension plan is a defined benefit plan, which means that when you retire under the FRS pension plan, your benefit is calculated based upon the benefit formula. And the benefit formula is your years of service times the percentage accrual value that you get for each year of service times your average final compensation. So that's how your benefit is calculated. The contributions that your employer's been making and that you have been making have no correlation to what your retirement benefit will be because those contributions are going to fund the FRS trust fund, which is the fund that's going to be paying you your monthly benefit under the FRS pension plan for the rest of your life after you retire. Okay. Now, the FRS investment plan is a totally different plan. It's a defined contribution plan. And what this means is that if you go into the um, FRS investment plan, when uh, part of the empl uh, employer contributions that are made on your behalf go over into the FRS investment plan, plus your employee contributions also go over into the F FRS investment plan, and you select the investment vehicle of your choice under that plan on how you want those monies invested. And then when you retire, basically the balance of your FRS investment plan account is your retirement benefit. Now, when the FRS plan was created, okay, the legislature uh, gave the responsibility for the FRS investment plan to the Florida State Board of Administration, who hired a private company called Aon Hewitt to administer that plan for them on their behalf. While the FRS pension plan has always been administered by the Division of Retirement, which is a division of the Department of Management Services. So we have two different state entities handling the two different plans. So when the legislature created the FRS investment plan, they also felt that there should be an educational component to the plan as well. Um, so they gave that responsibility to uh, the State Board of Administration who hired a, a third party company, uh, Ernst & Young, now known as EY, um, to handle that responsibility. So they were set up to help you with plan choice or your second plan election um, or if uh, any FRS member, regardless of what plan they're participating in, has uh, financial questions, you can call the FRS guidance line and uh, they can assist you at no charge with your questions. So that's a service that is provided to all FRS members through uh, EY. And EY's sole responsibility is to provide you with advice and help you with your de uh, financial decisions. Um, but they are not going to be selling you anything. So they're totally unbiased. They're solely hired to help you. All right, the other thing uh, that I also wanted to mention, there is a second web website called myfrs.com. 
This is the cooperative website between the Division of Retirement and the Florida State Board of Administration. And on that website, they have both pension plan information and both investment plan information, but they also have a lot of good financial planning tools on the myfrs.com website that you may find helpful in planning for your retirement. Now, I direct you to the Division of Retirement's website because everything on that website is very specific to you as an FRS pension plan member, but you can navigate to the myfrs.com website from the division's website uh, without a problem. And later on in this presentation, I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay? So um, uh, we're going to, our next presenter is going to be Dan Grable from EY Anyway, and he's going to be explaining more information uh, with regard to the financial planning tools that are probably available to you on the, on the myfrs.com website. But as I work for the Division of Retirement, and I do not work for the Florida State Board of Administration, Aon Hewitt, or EY, this pretty much concludes my conversation with you about the FRS investment plan, because my purpose here today is to tell you about your pension plan benefits. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, this information to you uh, during this uh, seminar. Okay, so... Under the FRS pension plan, okay, you're eligible to receive a retirement benefit when you are vested. And vested just means that you have the number of years of service um, to be eligible for a future benefit under the plan. So uh, for those who were initially enrolled prior to July 1st, 2001, when you were hired, the vesting provisions were applicable to the membership class that you were participating in when you were hired, and it was either seven, eight, or 10 years worth of service. And then what happened, uh, effective July 1st, uh, 2001, the legislature passed a bill that said um, the vesting provisions would be six years worth of service. So if you were initially enrolled uh, prior to the vesting provisions changing to six years, and you were actively employed on uh, July 1st, 2001, with an FRS participating employer, you automatically fell under the six-year vesting provisions. If you came back after that, you were not employed on that date, but you were initially enrolled prior to July 1st, 2001, uh, then you would have to come back to work if you were more than one year away from vesting under the provisions you were initially enrolled under, you would have to return back to work for one uh, calendar year or one work year in order to be able to fall under the six-year vesting. All right, and for those members initially enrolled on or after July 1st, 2011, they're subject to eight-year vesting. So the most important thing for each and every one of you to know is what is and when is your normal retirement date. Why is this important? Because your normal retirement date is the point at which you're first eligible to receive an unreduced retirement benefit, and it's also the point at which you're first eligible to participate in the drop. So when is your normal retirement date? Okay because all of you are, are in this room are initially enrolled prior to July 1st, 2011, okay? If you're a special risk class member, your normal retirement date is age 55 or 25 years worth of special risk class service, whichever occurs first, okay? Um, also, uh, special risk class members have a uh, second component to that, is if they uh, have a total of 25 years worth of credible service and military service that was purchased under the active duty military service provisions, then they can retire um, at age 52. Okay? Now, only people who were initially enrolled in the uh, FRS prior to January 1st, 1987, would be eligible to purchase their military service under the active duty military service provisions. And we're gonna talk about that uh, later on in this presentation. For all the rest of you that are not in the uh, special risk class, your normal retirement date is age 62 or 30 years worth of service, whichever occurs first. Now, if you're a special risk class member, okay, who also has regular class service, you have two normal retirement dates, okay? You could retire when you met 
the normal retirement date uh, for your special risk class service uh, or enter drop at that time. However, if you're not at normal retirement for your regular class service or other class service, then there would be an early retirement reduction on that. So you have two window of opportunities of, uh, of having a normal retirement date in that particular situation. So if you're reaching your normal retirement date by, um, by age, your normal retirement date is going to be the first of the month in which you turn that age. So if you're a regular class member and you're reaching your normal retirement date by age, uh, which is age 62, and your birth date is uh, you know, in January, then your effective normal retirement date would be January 1st. Okay? Um, if you're reaching your normal retirement date by years of service, your normal retirement date is going to be the first of the month. Following the month, you attain 30 years worth of service. So your anniversary date with your employer is not your uh, 30 years worth of service. Your employer reports salary to the division once a month. So after that salary is reported, you get service credit. So that's why service retirement dates and drop begin dates always start on the first of the month. Okay. Now with respect to drop, because I told you that uh, at your normal retirement date, that's your opportunity to enter into drop. So for K through 12 instructional personnel, they can go into drop at their normal retirement date or at any time after their normal retirement date and participate in drop for a full 60 months. Okay, but for the rest of us, okay, unless we're eligible to defer our 60 month drop participation period, we'll have to enter into drop at our normal retirement date if we wish to participate in drop for a full 60 months because your drop participation period begins at your normal retirement date. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So, um, and then at your normal retirement date, you have a 12-month election window to go into drop. Okay? And, uh, however, uh, during that first 12-month period, you can elect to go into drop prospectively at any point within that 60-month drop participation window. However, that election needs to be made in the first 12 months. However, for each month that you delay your entry into drop, you're going to lose an equivalent amount of months in drop participation because your 60-month drop participation period commenced at your normal retirement date. Okay? All right. So who are the people that can defer their drop participation? Okay. Um, if you're a regular class member and you reached your normal retirement date by years of service at a very young age, prior to age 57, you have the ability to go into drop when you reach your normal retirement date by years of service at that point in time, or you are eligible to defer your drop entry up until any month, up until the month in which you reach age 57. Then that's your point, uh, your last opportunity to enter into drop and participate for a full 60 months. And that's also the point at which that 12 month election window commences for you, okay? And then uh, for each month you delay your entry into drop, you're gonna lose an equivalent amount of months of drop participation, all right? And now elected officials, okay, um, uh, can also defer their drop entry up until the next term of office if they care to do so, but if they do that, um, uh, they can only participate in drop for uh, uh, that term of office or 60 months, whichever is less. Okay? And for special risk people, okay, if you're a special risk class member and you've reached your normal retirement, uh, again, by, age, by years of service at a very young age, uh, prior to age 52, you have the ability to defer your entry into drop up until any month, up until the month in which you reach age 52, then that's your last opportunity to enter into drop and participate for a full 60 months. And it's also at that point where that 12 month election window commences. All right, so everybody has a question about what is drop. It seems very confusing to everybody and drop is really very simple, okay? When you go into drop, you are retiring as far as the FRS pension plan is concerned, your benefit is calculated, 
and your monthly benefit is going into your drop account each month on a tax-deferred basis. So by participating in drop, it's a great way to be able to uh, continue working for up to 60 months and accumulate up to 60 months worth of retirement benefits uh, um, when you uh, terminate your employment. So that's the advantage of entering in drop. And so while your monthly retirement benefits are accruing in your drop account, uh, they're earning interest, an effective annual interest rate of 1.3%. And while you're participating in DROP, your retirement benefit is also going to receive a cost of living adjustment each July, just like a retiree would. And just like a retiree doesn't pay 3% employee contributions, once you go into DROP, any salary that you earned while in DROP, is you're not going to see the 3% employee contributions coming out of your paycheck. Okay, so that's, uh, those are some of the advantages of going into drop. Now, what happens when you terminate drop about three months prior to your drop termination date, okay, you're going to get a drop termination packet in the mail. And in this drop pa termination packet, there are going to be a couple forms, a DP-term uh, form, which you and your employer will have to complete to say, yes, I'm terminating on such and such a date when your drop ends. And also the DP-PAYT form, which is your drop payout method form. This is the form that you're going to need to complete and return to the division to tell us what do you want us to do with those 60 months worth of retirement benefits that have been accumulating in your drop account. And you have uh, three choices. You could elect to take a lump sum distribution of that, of your drop accrual. However, if you do, the Division of Retirement has to hold, withhold 20% of that for tax purposes. Depending upon your income tax bracket, you could also be subject to additional taxes. And if you take that distribution, a lump sum distribution, if you're a regular class member or any other class member, uh, or all classes, basically, if you take the distribution prior to the calendar year in which you reach age 55, then there, could be an there would be an additional 10% 10 uh, 10 tax penalty for early, uh, early withdrawal or early distribution on that. So perhaps you wouldn't want to do it. Now, uh, certain uh, um, law enforcement people have uh, the ability um, to... Uh, uh, take that distribution at a slightly younger age so you can refer to the drop guide for that information and also uh, consult your tax advisor on that as well. All right, so the, the options that you have in taking the distribution are the lump sum, which we just talked about, or you can do a direct rollover to another tax deferred eligible investment vehicle. For example, your IRA, you could roll it over to your deferred comp, or the, uh, the FRS investment plan also offers a vehicle to transfer those monies over to. And then you can then, at some point in time, elect to take the distributions incrementally over time uh, as you choose. All right, or there's a third option there. You can do a combi combined direct rollover and a partial lump sum distribution. Take a little bit of both. But the most important thing is that drop termination packet is sent to you uh, three months prior to your drop termination date. And you should have that form completed and sent back to the division prior to your drop termination date so that we can get those monies distributed to you. Because once your drop ends, okay, you're no longer earning any interest on those monies. And if you don't get that form back to us within 60 days of your termination date, the division's going to have to make that decision for you. And guess what decision we're going to make? We're going to make the lump sum distribution, withhold 20%, and you could be subject to additional taxes. So this is your money, so make sure you get those forms back for that. If you um, have entered into drop and you are uh, decided, you know, you signed up for the full 60 months, okay, and then somewhere in between you decide you want to terminate early, you need to advise both your employer and the Division of Retirement immediately so that we can get you that drop termination packet and uh, you can get it completed and we can get your uh, on-retired payroll timely. Okay, so remember, going into drop is retiring. When you're doing a straight service retirement, you're terminating your employment, you're going home. So when you're entering drop 
or retiring, we're going to calculate your retirement benefit. And the benefit formula, as I mentioned, is your years of service times the percentage value that you get for each year of service times your average final compensation. And when you work that formula out, that's going to give you your option one gross retirement benefit, at annual benefit. And then dividing by that tw uh, by 12 is going to give you your gross monthly retirement benefit because it's gross because benefits are subject to taxes. So bottom line is, what is your option one benefit? Your option one benefit is the benefit that's payable to you for your lifetime. Once you uh, pass away, there is no ongoing benefit to anyone. And the option one benefit is also the basis on which the other three benefit payment options that you may be able to elect to choose from uh, are based upon. So first we have to calculate the option one benefit. So let's talk about the components of that formula. Your years of service can be all the years of service that have been reported to you while you were uh, to the, the division, while, while you were working in an FRS credible position. Um, also, it can be any optional service that you may wish to purchase. And what are some optional service that you could purchase? Well, if you recollect, I mentioned uh, employee contributions when the system was first started. And what happened was a lot of employees terminated their employment and took a refund of their employee contributions. When you take a refund of your employee contributions, you are giving up the service credit associated with those employee contributions. So anybody who did that, uh, if they come back to work for one calendar, uh, one work year, uh, they would then be eligible to buy back their refunded service by paying back the contributions that they took plus six and a half percent per annum back to the year in which those contributions were associated with. Okay. The other uh, type of optional service that you may be eligible to purchase is uh, leave of absence service. If you, for example, um, went on maternity leave and you were on authorized leave of absence that was uh, in writing with your employer and or it was uh, authorized prior to your maternity leave or your leave or during your leave, and you return back to work immediately following that leave of absence for one calendar month, then you may be eligible to purchase that leave of absence service. So in order to buy that service, what you would have to do is submit the form FR28 to the division, and later on in this presentation, I'm gonna tell you where those forms are, and then you would then submit that form to that uh, employer that you were on that leave of absence with, and then they would send that form back to the division. We would determine your eligibility to buy that leave of absence, provide you with the cost, and then we would also provide you with comparative estimates of what your benefit would be with and without the purchase of that service for you to be able to make a determination of, as to whether or not that is service that you wish to purchase. Now, we talked previously about active duty wartime military service, okay? And as I told you previously, you had to be in, initially enrolled in the FRS prior to January 1st, 1987 to be eligible to buy your military service under this provision. And the military service had to have been performed during certain wartime military dates uh, and they had to be active duty military service, and those dates are outlined in your FRS member handbook. However, if your military service was used for uh, a military service retirement benefit, then you would be ineligible to buy that service under the FRS, okay? Um, so if you are eligible for that, then all you would have to do is submit your form DD-214 to the division, and then again, we provide you with estimates with and without both, okay? All right, so the other type of provision in which you can purchase services uh, under are the in-state, out-of-state service provisions. And basically under this provision, okay, you may be eligible to buy a cumulative total of up to five years of uh, in-state and out-of-state service. So what is in-state service? In-state service is service with any public employer in the state of Florida, not under the FRS, okay, 
uh, or it could be a service that you may have had with a charter school or a private school or a college in the state of Florida. And one of the caveats to being uh, eligible to buy this service is that you had to be participating in a retirement plan with that employer and must not be eligible to, uh, uh, for a retirement benefit under that plan nor uh, have taken a distribution of employer contributions. And again, the FRS member handbook will provide you more information on that. As far as um, uh, out-of-state service, um, this would be service with an out-of-state public employer. Again, under the same conditions that you had to be participating in a retirement plan with that out-of-state employer, not eligible for a retirement benefit from that employer, employer, nor have taken a distribution of employer contributions. So, and it can also include federal government service or it can also include military service. Um, so if you were purchasing military service or wanted to purchase military service under this provision, you would have to submit your DD-214 um, if it's in-state or out-of-state public service, then you would submit the form FR30, uh, complete that form, and then send that to that in-state, out-of-state public employer for them to complete that form and then return that form back. Uh, they would return that form back to the division, and we would provide you the cost as well as comparative estimates. Um, okay, now, in, when you're purchasing service, um, you can pay for that service. Um, from uh, another tax-deferred uh, vehicle that you have by rolling the funds over uh, from that tax-deferred vehicle to the Division of Retirement. And the form that you would do that on is the PRO-1 form, okay? And that's available on the members page under the forms listing. All right, so let's talk about the second component, which is the accrual value that you get for each year of service, okay? If you are a regular class member, and if you retire up, up through age 62 or up through 30 years worth of service, um, then you're going to get an accrual value of 1.60% for each year of service. If you're one of those people who's delaying their retirement because you have maybe the ability to defer your drop entry, uh, if you go retire or go into drop at age 63 or 31, the accrual value that you get for each year of service goes up to 1.63. And then at age 64 and 32 or 32, it goes up to 1.65. And then it maxes out at age 65 or 33 years at 1.68%. Senior management class members get a 2% accrual value for each year of service. Special risk class members for service earned prior to July 1st, 1974, they got a 2% accrual value. And for service earned after that date, they get the 3% accrual value. And our elected officers uh, class, the judges and justices, get a 3.33% accrual value. And all other elected officers get a 3% accrual value for each year of service. Okay. So let's talk about your average final compensation. For everybody in this room, because you were initially enrolled in the FRS prior to July 1st, your average final compensation is the average of your highest five fiscal years. And we track that the fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. Okay, so it's not the calendar year, it's the fiscal year. Now statute allows the payout uh, and when you retire or go into drop allows the payout of up to a total of 500 hours of annual leave to be included in the calculation of your average final compensation if that happens, your last year happens to be in your high five. So, in, uh, now there are, that's what it says statutorily. However, there are agency limitations. Okay, so each agency can set their limitations lower than that. So as most of you are state employees, okay, um, this is what the breakdown is. Career service employees can get a maximum of 240 hours of an annual leave payout um, at the time they retire or at the time that they enter into drop, uh, and that can be included in the average final compensation. Um, for senior management and select exempt, uh, the number of hours is maxed out at 480 hours. Now, if you're one of those individuals who've been getting those 24-hour um, payouts each year on your annual leave, uh, you may want to consult your HR department because that may impact the maximum uh, that you can get paid out at the time that you retire or at the time that you enter into drop. 
as far as it being included in your average final compensation. So the most important thing, what I'm trying to convey to you, if you're going to retire, your agency uh, through service retirement, your agency is going to pay you out on your annual leave. Okay, but if you're going in to drop, that's your choice. You're going to have to request the payout of your annual leave if it's going to be included in your average final compensation. Okay, uh, and that choice is yours. All right. So let's just work through a couple examples of a formula just for simplicity's sake. Um, this is a regular class member at normal retirement by uh, years of service. They've got 30 years worth of service and an accrual value of 1.60%. And for simplicity's sake, uh, we're just saying their average final compensation is $25,000. That's giving them that gross annual option one benefit of $12,000. Dividing it by 12, it gives them the gross monthly option one benefit of $1,000. Okay, if you're a special risk member, again, at normal retirement by years of service, 25 years times 3% times the same AFC uh, is going to give you a gross annual benefit because of the differences in the accrual value of 18750 and dividing that by 12 gives them the monthly gross option one benefit of $1,562.50. Now, if you're a member in both classes, okay, have both classes of service, when you're retiring, we're going to take your special risk class service, determine what the benefit would be for that, and then we're going to take your other service, in this particular example, regular class service, we're going to calculate your benefit for that and then combine the total. So remember, if you're a special risk member and you've got 25 years worth of special risk class service, but you don't have a total of 30 years worth of service, then you're, you're going to have an early retirement reduction because you're not at normal retirement for your regular class service. Okay? All right. So we have been talking about normal retirement, but you can choose to retire early. You know, we've all had that point where we say, I'm done, I'm through. I don't care, I'm terminating now. Okay. <clears throat> but bottom line is, if you're going to take an early, normal, uh, early service retirement, basically your benefit is going to be reduced by 5% for each year or pro rata share thereof that you're taking it before normal retirement age. So it doesn't matter if you have 29.75 years worth of service as a regular class member, okay, uh, if you're not, uh, you're not at normal retirement by years of service, so your benefit is going to be reduced by 5% um, for each year that you're under normal retirement age. And for regular class members, that's age 62. And for special risk class members, that's age 55. Okay? All right, so the most important and critical thing, a decision that you're gonna have to make when you retire or when you go into drop is you're selecting your benefit payment option. And the reason why this is so important because after your first retirement benefit check has been cashed, deposited, or after your first month of drop participation, you cannot change your benefit payment option. And I get those calls all the time, but this is what statute says. So as much as I may empathize with you, statutorily, I don't have the authority to allow you to make an option selection change. So what I'm trying to tell you is know what your benefit payment options are by requesting an estimate from the division. Each one of you in this room has gotten that estimate. Um, and then make sure you know what option selection you want to make when you submit the paperwork in. Because again, after that benefit check has been cashed, deposited, or after your first month of drop participation, you cannot change that benefit payment option. If you're having a problem deciding which benefit payment option you want to make, then call the FRS guidance line and ask them for assistance in helping you work through which option selection you wish to make. So <clears throat> basically, the option one benefit, as I told you, is the benefit payable to you for your lifetime. And there are the three other benefit payment options. And believe it or not, the options two, three, and four uh, benefits are actuarially equivalent to the benefit payment stream that you would receive under option one based upon life expectancy. All right? So option one benefit, uh, we've already explained, 
the option two benefit, this is how this works. Basically, if you're taking an option two benefit, what you are saying is, I'm going to take a reduced monthly benefit for the rest of my life. And if I should die within 10 years of my service retirement date, or within 10 years of my drop entry date, my beneficiary will receive the remaining payments due me within that 10-year time frame. And then when that 10-year time frame hits, then there are the benefit stops to your beneficiary. So bottom line is, if you're going to take an option two benefit, which is a 10-year time frame for your beneficiary to receive payments if you die within that 10-year time frame, if you uh, die after that 10-year time frame, which commences at the time that you retire or and also at the time that you enter into drop, if you die after that, then there is no ongoing benefit to anyone because you've already passed that 10-year time frame. Is that clear? Okay. All right. So the option three benefit, okay? If you're selecting the option three benefit, this benefit is based upon your age at the time that you retire and the age of your beneficiary who has to be someone who is a qualified joint annuitant. And I'll explain who those people are on the next slide. But basically, you're going to be taking a reduced monthly benefit based upon your age, the age of your joint annuitant, and your joint life expectancy. All right? And if you select this benefit, if you pass away, okay, then your beneficiary uh, your, or your joint annuitant is going to receive that same benefit for the rest of their lifetime. Okay? The option four benefit works a little different. And the option four benefit, you know, when someone looks at it, initially looks very enticing because your option four benefit is going to be higher, at least initially, than your option three benefit. Okay? But this is how the option four benefit works. Basically, it's, again, based upon your age at the time that you retire and the age of your joint annuitant and your joint life expectancy. And basically, while both of you are living, you're going to receive that monthly benefit. However... If you should pass away or your joint annuitant passes away, then the survivor, their benefit is going to be reduced to two-thirds of what you were getting while both of you were alive. Okay? And um, I, I'm going to be honest. I get the call from the spouse who says, how could he have chosen that option? And he did. And I can't let you change your benefit option because that's the way it is. So know your benefit payment options, read up on it, and make sure you understand it um, because it is probably one of the most critical decisions you're going to have to make at the time that you retire or at the time that you enter in the drop. So does anybody need any clarification as to these three benefit payment options and how they work? All right. Okay. So under option one or two, you can name anybody as your beneficiary, and you would say, well, I'm doing a straight service retirement. Why would I designate a beneficiary? Well, the thing is, is that you have been making employee contributions into the plan. Suppose you retired, and then you passed away the next month, okay? Um, if we have not, our, the retirement benefits that we have paid to you do not exceed the employee contributions that you made, then we have to give your beneficiary the difference of those employee contributions that still remain on deposit. So everybody should be designated a beneficiary even if they're selecting option one. If you're going to drop, you have to designate a beneficiary. We're not going to finalize your drop until you do because if you pass away while participating in the drop, we need to know who's going to get those monies that have accrued in your drop account. So, as I said, one or two, you can designate anybody as your beneficiary, a friend, a significant other, or charitable trust, whomever you want. Okay, but on option three, in order to have that um, option available to you, you have to designate someone uh, that qualifies as a joint annuitant. Okay, so who are your joint annuitants? It can be your spouse. Okay, it can be your parent, grandparent, or another person for whom you're the legal guardian, as long as you've claimed them as a dependent on your income taxes. Okay, or, okay, it can be your naturally or legally adopted child. Okay, however, if you're designating a child, okay, as your beneficiary under options three and four, it works a little different. 
All right, if you select option three and you designate your child as your beneficiary under option three, okay, you pass away. Um, that child will receive your option one benefit, even though you selected option three, the child will receive the option one benefit up until the age of 25. Then that benefit will cease unless that child is physically and mentally disabled and incapable of self-support, then that child will continue to receive your option one benefit for as long as they are continued to be physically and mentally disabled, okay? If you select option four and you designate your child as your beneficiary, all right, if, you should, uh, if your child should pass away, I mean, if you should pass away, excuse me, and uh, if your child is under the age of 25, when you pass away, that child will, even though you selected option four, that child will receive your option one benefit up until the age of 25, and then the benefit will cease. And if, uh, unless that child is physically and mentally disabled and capable of self-support, then that child will continue to receive your option one benefit. But the problem with selecting option four is this. If you name your child as your beneficiary under option four and your child predeceases you, guess what happens to your benefit? It, you got it. It's reduced to two thirds of what you were getting while both of you were alive. So be careful in your option selection. All right, so now that you understand normal retirement and that you understand uh, um, you know, about having estimates done for you and, and the benefit payment options, let's take a look at an estimate, okay? And I'm going to just let Scott adjust the cameras because what we're trying to do here, and I'm sorry for the interruption, is to provide all FRS members with the ability to view uh, these retirement seminars because we started these about two years ago um, for just people living in the Tallahassee area, and we'd like to be able to share this information with uh, all FRS members. Okay, so here's a copy of an estimate. All right, this person uh, requested an estimate, and this is an estimate for service retirement effective July 1st, 2015. And of course, um, they list their birth date and tells, them, tells us that this person was 59 years of age and seven months at the time that they are retiring. Because remember, your benefits are based upon your age at the time that you retire. Now, the biggest reason why we can't get people on retired payroll or into the drop program is because they have not provided us birth date verification, okay? And later on, we're gonna talk about what acceptable forms of birth date verification are. Um, but this is, uh, can delay your uh, retirement check if you're doing a service retirement because we're not gonna finalize it until we have that and can also delay your entry into drop. Okay. So this person has listed their spouse as their beneficiary. She happens to be the same age because she was born in the same year and month that he was. And if this person is going to select option three or four, we're going to need birth date verification for the spouse as well. Okay? And also, um, so the, there's a rule that is going into effect uh, sometime this month that will require anybody selecting option three or four who has designated their spouse as their beneficiary, you will also have to provide the division of retirement with a copy of your marriage certificate. So you should be looking for your birth certificates, and if you're designating uh, your spouse as your beneficiary under option three or four, you're also going to need to provide us with a copy of your marriage certificate. All right, so this estimate shows uh, what their cost of living adjustment is going to be on their retirement benefit. And later on, we're going to talk about how the cost of living adjustment is calculated. But for your cost of living adjustment is going to change with, with each uh, retirement, subsequent retirement estimate. If this person requested July and then they want an August or one for a year from now, uh, the cost of living adjustment is different. So let's, in the middle of the page, uh, right above the line delineation, you're going to see that this person purchased two years worth of military service. 
and uh, the military service is at the accrual value of 1.60% because this person uh, is uh, under age 62 and, and, and at 30 years worth of service. So the total accrual value they get for those two years worth of service is 3.20. For regular class service uh, that they had where the employer reported, they worked for an FRS reporting uh, employer for 28 years and they get an accrual value of 1.60% for each year of service for a total of 44.80% accrual value. So the person, reason why this person purchased their military service was to get to 30 years worth of service because they weren't at normal retirement by years, but they got there by purchasing the service, um, uh, the military service to get to normal retirement by years of service. So the total accrual value, the 30 years times 1.60%, gives them a 48% uh, uh, accrual value. So um, 48%, this is the exact same calculation we went through manually, 48% times the $25,000 uh, AFC, okay, gives this person a gross annual option one benefit of $12,000. So the option one benefit divided by, uh, dividing that gross annual benefit by 12 gives this person an option one benefit of $1,000. Now, the option two benefit for this person, based upon this person's age at the time they retired and their life expectancy, um, is 0 0.96543 um, um, of, uh, of the option one benefit, meaning that this person's benefit is uh, $965.41 a month. Okay? If this person uh, selected option three, based upon the age of him uh, at the time that he retired and the age of his joint annuitant, and their life expectancy, uh, it, the option one benefit would be, or option three benefit would be eight seventeen seventy. If either one of them passed away, they would get the same amount. Option four is higher than the option three benefit. Um, the benefit is nine oh nine nine uh, ninety eight. And if either one of them passes away, the survivor benefit's going to be reduced to six oh six um, sixty five. Now, if you had requested a service retirement estimate, this is what you'd get. If you had requested a drop estimate, this is going to be the first page of your drop estimate because this is where we're calculating what your retirement benefit options will be. So the second page of your drop estimate is uh, where you're going to see the drop accrual. So you can see at the top of the page, the member entered in a drop on July 1st, 2015. Their drop in date is 60 months later in June of 2020. They're participating for the full uh, 60 months and their effective an annual interest rate on their drop accrual is 1.30%. Then you're gonna see an option one column, an option two column, an option three column, and an option four column. And then those continue over to the right-hand side of the page. So we're just gonna go down the option one column because I'm a selfish guy and I'm taking my benefit and I'm not sharing it with anybody should I pass away because I want the highest amount I can get. All right, so the first month they go into uh, retire, and they go in July, $1,000 goes into their drop account. Second month, another $1,000 goes in, but there's a dollar and eight cents more there. What is that? That's the interest that they're earning on the monies that have accumulated in their drop account. Now, the next fix fiscal year in July, uh, there is where you're going to get the cost of living adjustment. Now, because this person had been retired the entire prior fiscal year, okay, then they're gonna get the full cost of living adjustment uh, on their first cost of living adjustment. So if you recollect from the first page, it said that the cost of living adjustment was 2.60%. So this person's benefit now is gonna go from $1,000 to $1,026. And then each fiscal year, um, the benefit goes up and goes up. And then at the bottom, it's gonna show their last month of drop participation under each option, it's going to select, show you how much money will have accumulated in your drop account, okay, um, over the drop participation period. And that's the money that you're going to uh, uh, complete that DPPAYT form and get it back to us to tell us what you want us to do with that money. Then the bottom of the estimate is going to show you what your benefit payment would be under each benefit payment option uh, on your first benefit check that you would receive at your home, okay? All right, so 
let's talk about the cost of living adjustments and how this uh, is calculated. Okay, what happened was uh, that the legislature passed a bill uh, that said any service that is earned on or after July 1st, 2011 is not eligible for a cost of living adjustment. Okay? But all our service that was earned prior to July 1st, 2011 is eligible for a cost of living adjustment. So when you retire, we're going to have to calculate what your cost of living adjustment is going to be. And how do we do this? We take your years of service um, that's eligible for the cost of living adjustment, meaning all your service earned prior to July 1st, 2011, and then divided by the total years of service that you have at the time that you retire or at the time that you enter into drop, and then multiply that by 3% in order to get your cost of living adjustment. In the example that I just showed you where the person had the 2.60% cost of living adjustment, that individual had, in that first example there, had 26 years worth of service that was eligible for the cost of living adjustment. And then they had 30 years worth of total service at the time they re uh, retired or entered into drop. So 26 divided by 30 times 3% gave us that 2.60% cost of living adjustment. So it will be all the years in, uh, of service, even if it's an odd amount, that will be included in the calculation. Okay? All right. So just one other mention. So the further out you go, okay, delaying your retirement, the denominator in that equation, meaning the total year's worth of service that you have, is going to get greater. Okay? And the cost of living adjustment therefore, is going to be less the further you delay your retirement, okay, if you work out the calculation. So, applying for service retirement, okay, all right, we encourage everyone to apply ahead of time. We'll accept your application for retirement up to six months prior to your effective retirement date, and uh, we encourage you to do that. However, for somebody who terminates their employment today, Okay, uh, which um, is today is uh, October 4th. I should know that. <laughs> um, if you uh, terminated your employment today on October 4th, okay, you would be eligible, okay, for a November 1st effective retirement date, the first of the month following your termination date of employment. However, if you terminate today, your application has to be into the division within 30 days of your termination date in order for you to be able to retain the November 1st effective retirement date. If you don't get your application in within that 30-day time frame, then your retirement will be effective the first of the month following the month we receive your retirement application. So bottom line is, if your benefit was $1,000, okay, and you didn't get uh, your application in within 30 days uh, of your termination date, then you've lost a month's worth of retirement benefits. Um, so you certainly uh, don't want to lose that, okay? So get your applications in timely, but the preferable thing is to get your applications in up to six months prior to your effective retirement date, okay? Applying for drop, okay, again, same rules apply with respect to that. You can apply for drop up to six months prior to your effective drop begin date, all right? And we recommend that. So the form to um, complete for the drop is the DP-11. That is the application. And then the DPLE is your drop notice of election to participate in drop, and is also your resignation of employment with your employer. So if you're one of those individuals who, let me just sidestep here, if you're one of those individuals, say, yeah, I'm only going to go into drop for two or three years, and then I'm going to terminate. So you fill out your paperwork for a shortened period of drop participation. That's fine, okay, if you choose to do so. However, you know, if you get to that two or three year point, you decide, oh my goodness, my situation has changed and maybe I don't want to terminate my employment, you're going to have to go back to your employer and say, I want to extend my drop for up to the 60-month period. And your employer could say no. So you may want to sign up drop uh, for drop for the full participation period 
And then if you choose to terminate prior to that, that's your choice. You would just need to notify your employer and the Division of Retirement immediately if your terminating drop, you know, prior to that 60-month period. Okay? All right. So the, um, those two forms need to, should be sent in. Again, if you want to participate in drop beginning this month, your drop application has to be at the division no later than the last working day of this month. Okay, otherwise you lose your eligibility to go into drop. If it's received on November 1st, it's too late to have an October date. And that may reduce the number of months you are eligible to participate in drop because you've delayed your application a month if you're within your 12 month period. Okay, or you may lose eligibility altogether depending upon your situation. Okay, so there are other forms that you need to complete for service retirement. And the first one is the FRS 11-0. This is your option selection form. Okay, if you don't know your option selection, don't submit this form, okay, until you do. We give you a, a little lead way there on uh, submitting that form into us. Um, but once we send you notification that we need it, you need to be sending it in, okay? Um, but know your option selection, have your estimate in hand, call the FRS guidance line if you don't know, talk it over with them, don't call the Division of Retirement because we don't give advice, that's what the FRS guidance line is for. The other form that you'll need to complete is the SA-1 form. This is the spousal acknowledgement form. This is the form that you're going to tell us whether you're married or not. It does have to be notarized. Okay, if you're married and you're selecting any, if you're selecting option one or two, then statute does require that your spouse acknowledge that on the SA-1 form that you've selected option one or two and not three or four, okay? So your spouse may have to sign off in that form. As I mentioned to you previously, birth date verification. We need uh, some of uh, the birth date verification that are acceptable. Is your birth certificate from the state that you were born in, not your hospital birth certificate. That's only half proof. So make sure if you're born in the state of Florida, you can get your um, birth certificate from the state of Florida or whatever state you were born in. If you were born outside the country, the birth certificate from the, 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 the country in which you were born. Okay. Um, Another acceptable form of birth date verification, which has just been um, changed by rule, is that we will accept a U.S. passport, a valid U.S. passport unexpired as birth date verification. We will also accept a Florida driver's license issued on or after January 1st, 2010, that was issued in accordance with the Federal Real ID Act. And how do you know if a Florida driver's license was issued in accordance with that act? If you take a look at the face of your driver's license, up in the right-hand corner of your face of the driver's license, adjacent to the image of the state of Florida, you're going to see a gold star. Okay, if your driver's license has a gold star, we'll accept that as birth date verification. If you're going to be using that as birth date verification, um, then we ask that you make in a large photocopy of it. Make sure it's a good, good photocopy because when it comes through our system, it's scanned into our system. Now, if it's sent via fax, sometimes faxes aren't very clear. You may just want to uh, take a copy of it and mail it to the division, put in your last name, first name on it, and, uh, and the last four digits of your social so we can link it up to your account. And there's no reason to wait until you retire to provide us birthday verification. You can do that now, okay? So get that over and done with. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, when this rule goes into place, which is going to happen any day now, if your select, if your application is not already with the division, when this rule goes into effect, if your application is received uh, when this rule goes into effect or after that, okay, you are going to have to provide us a copy of your marriage certificate if you're selecting option three or four and designating your spouse as your beneficiary, okay? So these are the things that you need to be looking for. All right, all these forms that I just referenced are on the Division of Retirement's website. If you go to our website, uh, go down to the members page of the website, then click on forms, okay? 
We have a drop service retirement packet containing all the forms that I just referenced and all the instructions, okay? Um, and uh, the uh, service retirement packet of forms, all the forms to apply for service retirement, okay, are all there as well as all instructions. Okay, now remember when you're submitting your applications for service retirement or drop, your employer has to sign off on the bottom of them. So you need to run your forms through your HR department. Okay, once they sign them, they should fax them in to us. If you want to fax them in to us yourselves, that may be a good idea just to ensure that they are received timely. Okay, all right. So the other thing is um, uh, once you're put on retired payroll, so if you're doing a service retirement and right before you get your first retirement benefit check at home, you're going to get the retiree packet. If you're a drop participant, this isn't going to occur until after you terminate uh, your drop and before you receive your first retirement benefit check at home. And you're going to get, receive a packet of forms in there. The first item in there is going to be the W-4P form, which is the form that you need to complete to tell us about the, uh, how many withholding allowances you want taken out of your retirement benefit for tax purposes. Um, the other form that you're going to receive in there is the Department of Financial Services form for direct deposit, but all of you in this room, okay, because you are state employees, you don't need to complete that out because your pay will automatically go into the same account that you've been paid uh, where your paychecks have been going to, okay? All right, but for anybody else uh, that is a non state employee, um, uh, they would have to uh, submit that form directly to the Department of Financial Services and then provide them a copy of their driver's license. Um, but however, the W-4P and the direct deposit form can be completed through your FRS online account. And I hope that all of you have signed into your FRS online account. And if you haven't, don't worry, we're going to show you how to do it, but you're going to need this as a retiree, okay? Uh, and as a drop participant. And you do need it as an active member as well. Um, when you, if you're doing a service retirement, as soon as you get your service retirement acknowledgement, because we get your application, then we acknowledge it, okay, you can then immediately log in when you get that notification or that acknowledgement into your FRS online account and do your uh, withholding allowance and sign up for direct deposit, which wouldn't be applicable to all you guys because you're state employees. Okay, um, but if you're a drop participant, once you get your drop termination packet in the mail, you can log in to your FRS online account and do your tax withholding. And for non-state employees, they can go and set up their direct deposit online, which then they wouldn't have to submit these forms, uh, uh, you know, uh, via U.S. mail. Now, the third item that you're going to get in that packet is the uh, health insurance subsidy uh, form for the certification of health insurance. Once you retire, okay, or after you terminate drop, okay, you are eligible to receive a, a health insurance subsidy benefit, okay, if you are maintaining health insurance after you retire. And what that health insurance subsidy is, is, is this. You can get an extra $5 per month for each year of service that you had at the time that you retired or at the time that you entered into drop. You can get an extra $5 per month up to a maximum of 30 years worth of service or $150 extra money a month to offset your health insurance cost. Okay? But in order to get this benefit, you need to fill out this HIS-1 form and have whomever you're maintaining your health insurance. If you're a state group employee, then you're going to have people first sign off on that form. If you're a Medicare person, you're going to just attach a copy of your Medicare card. But this form cannot be completed until after you've terminated your employment or after you have terminated drop. So don't submit it early because that's just going to be rejected and we're going to have to ask you to recomplete the same form. All right. Any questions on the health insurance subsidy so far? Okay. Right. All right. The other thing that I need to talk to you about is reemployment after retirement. Okay. And so during the first six calendar months of your service retirement, or in the first six calendar months following your termination date from drop, you cannot work for any 
FRS, participating employer, in any capacity. Now, this is particularly important during this period of time because we're coming up upon elections here. All right? And so people will say, oh, I want to go volunteer at the polls. Well, the truth of the matter is you can't volunteer at the polls. You have to be paid to work at the polls, okay? And guess who's going to pay you? The supervisors of elections. And guess who they are? They are FRS participating employers. So be very careful about who you work for. You can work for any private employer that you want, but you need to make sure that you are not working or going to be paid for uh, uh, work during that this six month time frame with an FRS participating employer because this will result in you voiding your retirement. Okay, and you will have to repay back any and all benefits that you receive. And if you were participating in drop, that means paying back your drop accrual. Okay, so you don't want to have that happen. In my opinion, you know, and it's my opinion, and I probably shouldn't be stating this on a, on a recording, but even as far as volunteering, you just want to be very careful because, you know, remuneration doesn't necessarily occur in a monetary sense, okay? Meaning you, you, you may be getting some other type of remuneration from that FRS participating employer that could result in a reemployment violation. So be very careful about what you do. There are 1,023 FRS participating employers, counties, municipalities, cities, in addition to state employees, okay, and colleges and universities. So be very careful. In the subsequent 7th through 12th calendar month, statute says, yes, you can go back to work for a participating FRS employer, but if you do, statute says you can't simultaneously receive a salary and a retirement benefit from a state-administered retirement system. So if you go back to work for a participating FRS employer during the 7th through the 12th calendar months, you're going to have to either notify the division to suspend your benefit, or you're going to have to for you will forfeit that, that month benefit for any month that you work for an FRS participating employer during that time frame. After this 12-month time frame has elapsed, then you can go back to work for any FRS and participating employer, and it will not affect your retirement benefit. So remember, it's just with FRS participating employers, you can go work for any private employer. If you're contemplating, you know, um, con being an independent contractor, okay, uh, by going back to work as an independent contract, uh, contractor with an FRS participating employer, you need to be calling the Division of Retirement, okay, because you have to have that independent contractor work approved because if it's later discovered that you've gone back to work as an independent contractor and that you were really not an independent contractor but an employee, this will void your retirement. So make sure that if you're contemplating doing something of that sort that you call the division and speak to our enrollment section regarding that. Okay. Um, renewed membership, if you do go back to work for an FRS participating employer, there is no renewed membership uh, in the system at all. So this includes not only the FRS pension, uh, pension and investment plan, but you can to get a benefit from uh, the state university uh, system optional retirement program or the state community college optional retirement program because they're all, those are all state administered retirement plans. Okay. All right. The other thing that I need to tell you about, and I always hate doing this because everyone in this room looks very nice, is um, uh, the concern about uh, forfeiting your benefits. Basically, if you commit a crime against your employer, okay, um, listed in these particular sections of statute or as listed in your FRS member handbook, if you commit a crime and you are convicted by a court or a competent jurisdiction of that crime, okay, uh, then that will void, uh, that will basically uh, cause you to forfeit your retirement benefits. So this is while you're working or while you're participating in drop. Okay, or if you terminate your employment as a result of admitting to one of these crimes, um, and uh, that can also result in the forfeiture of retirement benefits. But I'm sure that's not going to happen with anybody in this room. But, you know, when people get in desperate situations, they do desperate things. Okay, and so really think, uh, think about that. Okay, so the division's website is www.frs.myflorida.com. 
Okay, uh, the members page is where you're going to go to to get the forums listing. There are FRS quick clips there. You may even recognize the voice on some of those. Um, um, and we've got, uh, you know, frequently asked questions. There's all sorts of reference materials there. Once you're retired, after you've terminated DROP or done a straight service retirement, the retiree page has a lot of good information there. We've already talked about the publications page, um, legislation page. You know, each legislative session, you know, uh, there are a lot of bills out there proposed to change the system or make changes to it. If you wanted to keep abreast of any uh, proposed legislation during uh, the legislative session, that's where you can read that uh, information. And if you cared to be proactive in contacting your legislator, you are free to do that. Um, the laws and rules, chapter 121 of the Florida statutes and chapter 60S of the Florida Administrative Code can be found there. And of course, all the contact numbers to the division. I mentioned getting to the myfrs.com website. On the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a link, uh, the icon uh, off to the right. That's how you can get to the myfrs.com website. But most importantly is getting to your FRS Online account and how to do that. Okay, once you click on that FRS Online icon, okay, if you've never logged into your FRS Online account, then you would click on the Click Here button as a new user. Okay, now you can start your setting up your, your profile on FRS Online, and it's going to ask you for that My FRS pen that you got in your plan choice packet, and I'm sure you all know where you put it, right? Okay, same place I put mine, but don't panic, okay? You can, if you don't know your pen number, all you have to do is request a pen, all right? And then the pen will be mailed to you 10 days later. Don't call the Division of Retirement because we don't know your pen either. Um, but it has to be mailed to you, and upon receipt of that, then you can complete your login process to FRS Online. And then once you've uh, done that, um, you can enter your username and password. Just remember, passwords are case sensitive. Now, if you try to log in as a new user, and you've got this error code that uh, says it doesn't recognize your, your, your Social Security number, do not panic. We haven't lost your service. What that means, more than likely, is that you previously logged into your FRS online account and it doesn't, it doesn't recognize your social anymore, it recognizes your username and password and, you, and therefore you need to click on the forgot your username or password link at the bottom of the page and then it will default back to entering in your social so that you can complete your online process, okay? All right, so why is it important to get into your FRS online account? Well, when you log into your account, you're going to have two sets of modules. You're going to have the My Account modules, and as an active member, you're going to have the Member Services module. So under the Member Service modules, which everyone will have in their account, the profile settings is where you're going to, you know, you can change your password, set up electronic, uh, 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 you know, electronic election or notification. Because if you select electronic notification and you request an estimate from the Division of Retirement, you know, we can upload that estimate to your FRS online account immediately when we complete it, and then you have it in your hand or have it on record, okay? If you call in and request an estimate from us and you don't have electronic uh, um, a preference selected, then we're going to mail you your estimate. And um, everything that we generate is generated uh, that night, and then we uh, mail it out the next day. So. This certainly can expedite your receipt of any information that you may be getting from the division. Communication preferences, or oh, under profile settings too, you may want to use your personal email address as opposed to your work email address because when you retire, your work email address is no longer going to be a valid email address. So make sure you go into your FRS Online account and update the email address so that you can get all the notifications from the Division of Retirement. Um, um, messages were just messages you get from the division. But as an active member, you're going to have a set of modules called member services. And if you go to the history summary, this is going to tell you, um, uh, give you a history by fiscal year of all your service under the FRS. And you may look at that note in one fiscal year, gee, I, I don't have a full fiscal year worth of salary reported that year, or a full fiscal year of service credit. 
And then you say, oh, that's the year I was on a leave of absence. Maybe I want to buy that leave of absence or inquire about that. So checking the history summary could give you a good idea about that. Service summary is just going to give you the total year's worth of service that you have as of the last payroll date. Uh, that was reported by your division. Like for October salaries are not going to be reported by your division until the, about the fifth working day of November. Okay, So there is about a month lag in there. Um, beneficiary, as an active member, now I've told you already that as a, when you retire you're going to have to designate your beneficiaries, but as an active member you should be designating your beneficiary in the event that you pass away while you're actively employed prior to retirement or entering the drop. And because, uh, you know, if you should die, it's an automatic option three to your spouse and then to your, your children if under the age of 25 or then it goes into your estate. But then we have to wait for the court documentation to tell us who the beneficiaries are. If you go into your FRS online account and designate your beneficiary as an active member, then if you should pass away while you're actively employed, we already know who your beneficiary is. Okay, so that will expedite the process for your beneficiary in getting those monies. Now, once you retire and fill out your retirement paperwork, that's you know going to override any other decision because that's your final paperwork submitted in. All right, member annual statements. As you know, member annual statements are no longer mail. They're now a virtual document, best viewed in the electronic format, and they're uploaded to your FRS online account. So. And they're uh, much more comprehensive than they were, uh, once were, and so I encourage you to do that. Um, if you were in a situation, as we talked about before, you want to see if you terminate your employment today and retired effective the first of the month, you could do a current estimate, see how much your retirement benefit would be if you did that. Or if you wanted to create estimates for various dates, you could do that. If you're a drop to, you know, a person who's eligible to defer their drop entry, you know, because you reach your years of service at normal retirement at a very young age and you have that ability to defer your drop entry, then you could go in here and have an, create estimates for varying dates um, yourself. Um, the FRS Home just gets you back to the website. There's a frequently asked questions section, all the forms, and of course, again, the contact numbers to the division, et cetera. Now, once you go into drop, okay, you're gonna, your member service modules are no longer there. Once your drop has been finalized, oops, excuse me, um, it's going to be drop services. So when you go into drop and we finalize your drop accrual, we're going to provide you or mail you your drop accrual, okay? And you probably have, would file it in the same place that I filed my FRS PIN number, okay? Um, and don't know where it is. And so you're participating in drop, and all of a sudden you say, um, you know what? I'm done. I want to know how much money is accumulated in my drop account. How much is my drop accrual if I uh, terminated my employment today? Okay? You can go right into your FRS online account and see how much money is accrued uh, on your drop account without having to search the house for that final drop accrual that we mailed to you. Okay? All right. So um, drop information is where you can view your beneficiary selection, who you selected as beneficiary. Um, under option one or two, you can change that because uh, the beneficiary's age and everything doesn't affect the option one or two uh, benefits. So if you get mad at somebody or your beneficiary passed away, then you can change your beneficiary logging right into your FRS online account and do that. Now, if you're changing, you want to change your uh, beneficiary under option three or four, that's a different story. You're going to have to contact your survivor benefits section to do that because your benefit's going to have to be recalculated because remember under option three or four, your joint annuitant's age, okay, factors into the calculation of uh, the option three or four benefits. So that would be a recalculation and you would have to contact our survivor benefits for that. Okay, so once you've come out of drop and you've been put on a retired payroll or once you've uh, gotten your first retirement benefit check at home, you can log into your FRS online account and go to the account information um, module and view your monthly uh, benefit payment stubs. We do not mail them to you. So if something has changed with your benefit check about and you want to see what has changed, maybe your insurance went up, uh, I don't think it'll go down. Um, um, you can go into your FRS online account and view the benefit payment stub. 
uh, beneficiary again. Um, if you had that 10 year time frame and you're still within that 10 year time frame and you selected option one or two, you can change your uh, beneficiary. Okay, address change. As an active member, your employer has been reporting your email, your address to us with each payroll report. So if something isn't being mailed to you at the correct address, that's because your agency isn't reporting the right address and you need to be notifying your HR department to change your address, okay? Because um, even if we took your address change, it's gonna revert back to what your employer was reporting. So that's why we direct you back to your agency so they can correct it. But as a retiree, you are responsible for keeping your address up to date. So if your address changes, okay, you need to update it here. If you fail to do that, um, it's conceivable that we could stop your retirement benefit because we don't know where you are, even if you're having your benefit directly deposited. So keep it current. If you wanted to change your direct deposit, you could log right into your FRS online account and change it um, through this link. Um, and um, that can pretty much concludes my presentation. These are the contact numbers to the division as well as our email address. So I guess at this time, uh, we're uh, getting uh, done rather early. Um, I'll open up the room to any questions.